Are we going to start with a close up of me and slowly zoom out? So, welcome to uh, what is the second to last speaker of this year's Law and Technology Speaker Series. Uh, many of you already know our speaker because we brought in people from both outside of law school but within Elon and then outside Elon, and then within Elon and within the law school, just to add different elements and test to think through who's who and classify. We are delighted to have today Professor Mike Rich from the law school right here, uh, who's going to be talking about his work on algorithmic decision making in law enforcement based upon his article that was published just a couple of days ago, right, uh, in the Penn Law Review. As always, the format for these talks are not lectures, but rather discussions. So we encourage audience feedback, comments, thoughts, and the like. Uh, and I will turn it over now to Mike. Thanks All for right. Us. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm going to, I, I assume all of you have read the article. Um, no, I'm not actually going to be talking about it anyway. Um, I'm going to be kind of talking. <clears throat> Instead, this is, I'm using this as an opportunity to um, talk through um, what I hope will be the next article that I write this summer that's on the same topic about algorithmic decision making and policing, um, but really addresses less constitutional questions and, and really instead looks at um, what I see as problems in how these um, how the algorithms that will be used by police um, are developed. And <clears throat> And in particular, I want to make the argument that, um, that the use of what I call um, big data policing um, is likely to really just kind of result in algorithms that, um, that reinforce prior political decisions that have been made by the police. Um, in other words, um, we're essentially going to end up with a police force um, that through the use of this sort of big data policing methods and algorithms and tools, um, get really, really good at doing what they've always done, targeting the same people, targeting the same crimes, and targeting them in the same places. Um, but they'll be doing it now kind of under um, a, a kind of gloss of apparent bias, absence of bias, and absence of, um, of kind of political decision making. Um, instead, it'll be appear to be driven um, by kind of science and cold hard data that is unbiased. Um, and so I want to do it by, I want to make this argument by stepping through how these algorithms are created or what is necessary um, to have a big data policing tool or algorithm. Um, but of course, first we need to understand what big data policing is or what I mean by that. Um, and it's just pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> what I mean is, uh, the use using um, the troves of data that have been collected historically and are now being collected about people um, in order to predict crime. And there's a lot of different examples of big data policing out there now, um, and they're more coming all the time. So to give you kind of some examples of what big data policing could mean, um, it could mean things like um, threat level software that is being used by police in some large cities by which individuals, um, based on some set of data that's available to the software, um, a, gives every person that the police interact with a threat level. It's either green or yellow or red to tell the police whether um, they sh how threatened they should feel before they interact with this individual. Another example of big data policing is um, something called policing heat maps where uh, these maps are generated um, based on old data to tell police where certain crimes are likely to happen, right? So they learn that um, in a certain three block radius in a city, um, it is likely that people will be stealing cars at a certain time of day, certain range of time on a day. Um, or it could be um, algorithms that look more specifically at individuals to identify individuals who are likely engaged in certain criminal conduct based um, on characteristics of that individual as well as past conduct and even kind of real-time conduct of the individual. So those are all kinds of what I mean of, by big data policing. It's a pretty broad category of emerging tools that police are using 
to, uh, to do their job. And, um, and big data policing, in order to kind of create a big data policing tool, you need three things. You need old data, you need an algorithm, and then you need new data to feed into the algorithm to get results. Um, and then we'll also talk about secrecy, which is kind of just a fourth issue. Um, but you want to start by thinking about old data and, um, and how the use of old data um, will just, again, as I've kind of said, re-entrench these political decisions, right? I mean, old data that is used to train the algorithm. Um, in other words, to tell the algorithm how to work, how to identify hotspots within a city, how to identify individuals who are likely criminals, um, how to identify who's likely to be a threat to police, um, is based on old data of who was a threat to police or where those crimes were committed previously and that sort of thing. And of course, old data comes from old activities, past activities of the police, right? You know, and, and that old data is therefore limited in a lot of, in, 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 in most situations to, <clears throat> Pri to prior police decisions about who to police, right? So decisions about um, which individuals were deserving of police attention. And I think all of us can appreciate that when police make decisions about who to interact with, who to target for policing, um, those decisions certainly can be infected by conscious bias, right? Um, by just plain old racism or um, dislike of a religion or sexism or whatever. Um, but they also can be affected by unconscious bias. And unconscious bias um, is precisely what it sounds like. It is a bias that we all have that is unconscious. We don't know that we're doing it, but it nevertheless infects um, the way that we perceive the world and the decisions we make when we interact with people. Um, and that old data is going to be infected by these kinds of old biases. Um, likewise, um, the old data is circumscribed and limited by um, decisions by police about what to police. And by this I mean, what crimes matter? Where should we, we be devoting our effort? Um, and so, you know, we're all familiar, I think, with um, criticisms that police don't spend enough time pursuing, say, white-collar criminals, but spend an enormous amount of time pursuing drug dealers. Um, and again, those may be good decisions or bad, deci bad decisions, but they're decisions that matter. Because if we don't spend a lot of time pursuing a certain kind of criminal activity, we're not going to have a lot of data about it from which to train an algorithm to look for it in the future. Um, and so we'll see these, again, the same old decision being replicated going forward. Um, and then another way in which old data is limited it is, it's limited by decisions by the police about where to look for criminal activity. So police spend a lot more time in low-income neighborhoods than they do in high-income neighborhoods. And they spend that time looking for criminal activity. Um, and they then find the kind of activity that occurs in those neighborhoods. Um, and they don't find the kind of activity that occurs in other neighborhoods and other places. And as a result, again, we have old data that is, uh, that is then used to train an algorithm. And that old data um, is limited by these policing decisions. And as a result, it's only good for creating algorithms that kind of replicate or look for the same things, look for the same kinds of criminals, same people in the same places doing the same things. All right, so that's the old data. And then there's issues with how an algorithm is created. Algorithms are created, you know, these tools are created by programmers, right? By data scientists, computer scientists, smart people. Um, and generally, I fully think well-meaning people. Um, but they're well-meaning people with essentially, usually, a single goal. And that goal is to create a tool that police want to pay money for. And as a result, there is very little reason to think that the people who create these tools are going to create tools that challenge or upset police expectations about crime. So in other words, the programmers have every reason to mimic what they understand police to want to see. And as a result, we're going to have tools that ultimately follow policing trends. 
And they may do it in a more explicit way because, of course, a smart computer programmer data scientist isn't going to just sit down and try to create one of these tools out of whole cloth. They'll sit down and by themselves, they'll sit down probably with a policing expert of some kind. But of course, that policing expert is then only going to add in the same sort of, um, you know, I'll say biases, but I don't mean that just in terms of things like race or gender or whatever. I just mean kind of old understandings and expectations about where crime is and who commits it and what crimes matter. So that's another issue. Um, and then also, we need to understand that in the creation of algorithms, Can yes, yes, of course. So I've been thinking about some as you Wait, can I interrupt you? Yes, okay, no, go ahead. Uh, I don't answer questions. Oh, okay, well, that's fair. This is not, not your job here. Yes. Um, uh, I only ask. Uh, so, no, but, but the, uh, I've been, as you know, I've been thinking about some of these same issues, and I'm curious what you mm -hmm. just said. And this, this, I don't want to sidetrack you to the point where this is, you have to take the rest of the time to answer it. But can algorithms have moral authority given the kinds of decisions that? Are coded into them. Like, what do you mean by moral authority? The ability to draw on instincts, right, or to have responsibilities for the consequences of decisions that we generally ascribe to morality. Hmm. So, in other words, can they make immoral decisions? And, and can they be held responsible for those decisions? Um, I don't believe algorithms can, because I don't believe our law is set up to do that. Um, but people can, um, but I think the way that any really complex tool is created involves the work of so many programmers that I don't that I think there's no individual to hold responsible as a general matter. So, can we hold the machine? We, I, I suppose, you can hold the machine as much as you'd like. So, um, can we hold it responsible? Not in any meaningful way that I'm aware of. So. Um, well, I suppose you could, but I don't know that it really uh, understands that as punishment. So, um, but I mean, sure, you can, right? I mean, you can choose to use different tools. Um, but that kind of ultimately gets to where I'm going to end up here, which is that in order to make decision, smart decisions about which tools to be using, um, we can't just have um, police be doing that. Because for the same reasons that I've kind of already articulated and will continue to hammer home, that police are... Um, you know, they have their own understandings and beliefs of, about the world that we only perpetuate when we allow them to have all of the decision-making authority and all the steps of this process. So. Is the, uh, I'll, I mean, no, no. This, but I'll just see if, if, if human beings are coding, I mean, you, so you use the examples, right, of human beings coding well-meaning, mm -hmm. right, and then presumably unintentionally coding decision-making processes into law enforcement technology results in uh, some kind of uh, output that we deem to be socially problematic. Mm -hmm. okay. um, do, and maybe this is why I think you might get to it, how much of the output can we attribute to the coding or to the human beings given the lack of intentionality, mm -hmm. right? If we assume that that's the case, versus a general lack of appreciation for the impact of that code, which I think from a moral standpoint would then suggest less culpability for themselves. Um, was there a question in there? Yeah, just, yeah. Or, or what do I think about that? No, I mean, I think I, I, think I agree. Um, I'll, I will admit, though, um, I think it's an interesting more of an interesting philosophical question where the moral uh, culpability lies when, you know, with a, with a poorly functioning tool. Um, I'm not, I, I think maybe I'm just more too pragmatic in how I'm thinking about this, where I kind of don't really care who to blame as much as to note the way that the process is set up um, to lead to a bad result and thus how to fix it. So. But, but no, I mean, I think that's an interesting kind of theoretical question. So, yeah. I interrupted you. No, I mean, I continue. Yes. Anyone else? No, I don't mind. I don't, I, so. Um, so the other thing that I kind of want us to be thinking about when we think about um, how algorithms are created and, um, and who's involved and why that matters um, is that we also ought to, we need to recognize that the programmers who create these tools um, make tons of decisions 
when they do it, right? I mean, they're not just taking data and kind of as, you know, thoughtless um, translators just translating it into a language to be used and, and then kind of just letting automated processes work their magic and create a tool, but rather they make tons of decisions throughout the process. Um, and a lot of these decisions are um, essentially political decisions. Um, and so for, you know, one very good example is um, anyone who creates um, one of these, any sort of predictive algorithm, um, needs to decide which is worse, false negatives or false positives. In other words, is it worse to mistakenly identify a person as a non-criminal when they're in fact a criminal, um, or is it worse to identify a person um, as a criminal who is in fact a non-criminal? And how much worse is one result over the other? Because that'll determine kind of the sensitivity that the algorithm has to various, uh, various, you know, um, to, to um, reaching different bad, incorrect results. Um, but obviously, that's not an easy question. I mean, you, you know, there are criminal law classes where you could spend an entire class discussing things like, is it worse for 100, you know, 100 uh, guilty people to go, f or innocent people, guilty people to go free versus one innocent person to be jailed? Um, and yet that, that question is often going to be left in the hands of a programmer who kind of does the best they can, um, but doesn't really have input outside of um, the people that that programmer is working with, which is going to be a very limited universe and a narrow scope of people. Um, and so those sorts of political decisions um, may well be influenced by who's in the room, which often to at most will be um, a, a, a bunch of programmers plus perhaps a police expert. Um, and so again, we're not, we, we in fact aren't challenging any of the assumptions that underlie, um, that underlie the, the kind of what police have been doing for a number of years, except to the extent that these programmers have some different ideas than perhaps the police. Um, but of course those programmers remain motivated to create tools that in fact reflect police values and, and, and beliefs and, and ethics in these areas. Okay, so then finally, um, in order for these, any sort of big data policing tool to work, we need new data. Um, that new data, right, is, is what the algorithm is going to use to now make its predictions. Um, okay, and so we need to be asking ourselves, well, you know, where does that data come from, right? I mean, where are the eyes and the ears and the sensors that create, the, that kind of collect this new data? Well, again, this is impacted by political decisions. Now, these may not be necessarily police decisions, but they are still um, decisions that are political in a broader sense that may have been made by actual politicians, but certainly with police input. Um, after all, we can kind of ask, like, where are public video cameras? Public video cameras, as a general matter, are not within gated communities where rich people live. They generally are in places where there's already a perception that a lot of crime occurs, which tend to be low-income neighborhoods. Um, we also can ask, well, where are like other sorts of sensing devices? You know, gunshot sensors are not in New Irving Park. Um, gunshot sensors are much more likely to be in the south and east of the city of Greensboro. So if we think about it in that way, we realize that the new data is only going to be collected from the places where we where we already think crime is occurring, and thus, again, reinforcing um, those old ideas about, um, about what matters in policing. Um, and then we also, as a general matter, are going to need data about people. And that data about people will generally be generated through contact with the police. So in other words, some of the new data that's being used will, in fact, just be old data repurposed now as new data, because it will involve prior arrests, um, prior convictions and all of this stuff, um, you know, will predate the algorithm itself and will have, again, been influenced by all of those past policing decisions. Great. So we have a bunch of stuff that goes into this algorithm um, that is all just kind of old data or old decisions repurposed or, in, you know, influenced by these old decisions. Um, and then we have the issue of secrecy, right, which is my fourth point. Um, and secrecy in big data policing tools comes um, at a number of levels. Um, at the very technical level, um, some big data policing tools are going to be generated through, um, through methods that essentially create a black box, that create um, an algorithm that is too complex 
um, for a human being to understand. Um, it's too complex even for the programmer of the algorithm to understand um, exactly how it works. Um, and obviously that creates a hurdle for trying to you know, get some sense of how these are working and to influence the working of the algorithms. Um, but then stepping back, and not all tools will be so complex, um, but then stepping back, most of these tools will be, gen will be created by third-party vendors. So private companies will create them. And when those private companies um, sell or license their, um, their, their tool to um, police, as a general matter, they um, include in their, their agreement non-disclosure provisions. Likewise, those uh, third, party, um, third parties will claim trade secret status for how their algorithm works, how their tool works. And at least in the policing area, um, and Professor Levine can correct me if I'm wrong, since this is very much his area of research, um, courts in the policing area have tended, though there's not a lot of cases, have tended to be, very, to be quite sympathetic to these trade secret claims. And so haven't required um, how these, these big data policing tools work to be disclosed when criminal defense asks for them to be disclosed. Um, so still an area of developing law, but as a general matter, um, you know, that provides another hurdle for any sort of looking into how these things work. Um, and then finally, um, there is kind of built into the criminal justice system a resistance to transparency when it comes to criminal investigatory methods. As a general matter, courts are not going to force police to explain how they police for fear that if that happens, criminals will adjust their conduct to avoid police detection. It's a perfectly legitimate concern, right? But we can see that, again, it would just sort of reinforce courts' resistance to break through uh, or to deny a trade secret claim um, or to otherwise require transparency when it comes to how these tools are functioning. Um, so then I suppose that, Mike, oh yes, I, you, you please. Good. Only to, only to the extent that you understate the power of the trade secret claim. Okay. So say, it's, say they, uh, easily. you're right. Oh. Say, they, say they lack sympathy, though, uh -huh. is putting it nicely. Okay. Right? The, the likelihood of defeating a trade secret claim when it comes to uh, law enforcement technologies uh, is near zero. Okay. Based upon court cases. However, there is in camera review mm -hmm. that some courts have. Excellent. So it's a, it's a, it's a mess. I suppose I should preface, should have prefaced this by saying I haven't done any real research into a lot of the things that I'm saying right now. <laughs> yeah, um, and so, uh, so I'm not sure I'm making all this up exactly, um, but yeah, so good, thank you. I will be seeking your guidance more yeah, later. Making it up, that's uh -huh. just all the more interesting. But yeah, right, exactly, exactly. So, all right, um, and so then kind of the last thing that I want to mention before I briefly talk about solutions and then hopefully hear your guys' thoughts, because like I said, I mean, this is very early um, stage for me in this process, but um, is that we need to, uh, is, is another problem on top of secrecy here um, is the, what I think of as like the patina, the gloss of fairness that exists when it comes to algorithmic decision making. Um, certainly there has been some uh, pushback against that recently, um, but I don't know that as kind of a, in, in terms of popular culture, um, that there has been enough work done to kind of break through the myth that algorithmic decision making is inherently fair. Um, I think there is a sense that when you say that a decision is based on data, that it, it sounds like it is now um, cleansed of bias, um, bias writ very broadly, right? Meaning, again, both racism and sexism and all those things, but also just kind of bias in terms of um, decisions, political decisions about what matters when it comes to um, what police ought to be doing, um, which is, you know, for all the reasons I've said, not accurate, um, but I think it nevertheless functions as um, another reason why um, courts will be resistant to, um, to force these tools to be more transparent in, um, in how they work. Um, I think it also will be a good counter argument um, to those who may agitate um, to make changes 
once these tools are in use on the argument that they are, they are just perpetuating unfairness. Um, and I think, and, and as a result, I mean, that's, that it, it presents, again, another real hurdle for making these uh, tools effective and, um, and, and for them to actually fulfill their promise, which is to remove, um, you know, kind of remove the things we don't like about policing from what police do, right? Remove the bias, remove the tendency to over-police certain neighborhoods, remove the tendency to focus on certain kinds of crimes. Um, so then what's the solution? Well, I think there's really two. I mean, one is that we need to figure out how to craft appropriate um, uh, po or policies that allow in an appropriate amount of sunlight um, in terms of um, allowing us to see how these tools work, right? What, what data they're using, how they're using that data, and, um, and, and how they function. Um, but then we also need policies or um, a move towards getting more people in the room to actually make the decisions as these tools are being developed. So figuring out how to get um, people who are part of different constituencies than just programmers and police experts in, including lawyers, um, including privacy experts, including community leaders, um, to both into the room, into the development of these tools, uh, but perhaps more importantly, um, into the room and decisions are made about when these tools are going to be acquired and when they're going to be used. Um, so, for instance, just reading this morning that, <clears throat> you know, there's a, um, a, a bit of a kerfuffle in Oakland, California, where the city of Oakland created um, a permanent privacy commission that was supposed to be involved in uh, decisions by the police to acquire, to, uh, acquire da big data policing tools. Um, and, but then it was revealed that um, the, uh, poli the Oakland police had acquired um, a particular tool that scans social media um, looking for things that you would imagine police would look for on social media um, and had done so without any input from the uh, Privacy Commission. The reason being that the Privacy Commission's uh, jurisdiction was limited to expenditures of over $25,000 and this had only cost $10,000. Um, and so Privacy Commission was not, um, was, was not consulted and the Oakland police purchased this system. So, I mean, we see moves towards this sort of inclusion of other stakeholders in the decision-making process um, of when these tools should be used, but there's still a lot more work to do there as well. So, all right. Thoughts? Questions? Comments? Yeah, Max? Would you say that more police departments are going more towards that algorithm theory of policing as opposed to like the community theory? Of I think there certainly are police departments that are really into big data policing. Um, and they often are larger police departments because they have the resources um, or more resources to spend on these tools. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I think there are more that are interested in those new tools than are interested in, I think, what may be viewed as older theories of community-based policing. Yeah. So you can't have one of these discussions without somebody bringing up money at all. Oh, good. I was thought you were going to say Minority Report, which no, is usually but, the. But no, because and, and you know, and I think that's where a lot of the public's acceptance of big data comes from. Uh huh. Um, but there, you're dealing with a relatively small set of variables, played out a lot of times mm -hmm. in a very public place, with an agreed upon binary win loss mm -hmm. end result. How do you test an algorithm in something like criminal justice in order to refine and get those kind of results to know that you're gauging the, the right things? Because an algorithm is only as good as the code mm -hmm. and the data you put in. Right. Well, I mean, I think it, you're, you're absolutely correct um, in that the best algorithms are going to be ones that target criminal activity, which is you know, uh, frequent and um, occurs oftentimes in the same way and that sort of thing. Um, you know, so you'd be looking for things, well, and, and ones that create data to look at, right? Um, so I think some areas where these sort of algorithms would be best used um, are crimes that occur online um, or through electronic processes. So for instance, the SEC 
um, has been kind of a leader at using um, data analytics to try to ferret out insider trading. Um, you know, there is a, a project going on at Carnegie Mellon right now to um, identify sex trafficking through online ads. Um, and but I think another area where the where this this sort of where this sort of policing is useful um, is for you know street crimes that happen a lot. So car theft is one that's targeted. Um, drug dealing, like on like you know hand to hand drug transactions in open air drug markets. Um, that you know now there also are algorithms that are used to try to identify terrorists, but there and there people who are experts in data analytics point out precisely what you're noting, which is you need a lot of data in order to have a good algorithm, but that doesn't stop anybody from generating the algorithm and trying to use it, right? right. Well, the other thing is, like, to, use, to continue with the money ball, mm -hmm. the other 162 games, right. games, you don't know how many drug transactions. Right. No, and that's absolutely true as well, right? I mean, so there are certainly unknowns there that are important. Um, and I, I guess, you know, without getting out of my depth in terms of statistics and data analysis, um, I think in some ways the answer to the question is just, yes, those are problems, um, and, but data scientists oftentimes are um, perhaps willing to believe in the capacity of their, um, of their science to answer questions better than maybe they can. And certainly, venture capitalists are always willing to profit um, if they can. And police are willing to believe in tools that maybe they shouldn't believe in, which you know, to me only underscores the need to have kind of cooler heads in the room um, when decisions, both when tools are generated, but maybe most importantly, when decisions are made about when to use them. Yeah, Tim. Mike, would you kind of amplify, for me at least, on balance your, your view of these tools in the sense of do you view them as good tools that have potential problems that we should work to eliminate or, or make them more effective? Or are these bad tools that pragmatically the reality is police departments are going to use them and the things that we should do should be to guard against, you know, make it as you know, make it as less bad as possible. Yeah, um, no, no, that, and that's a totally fair question. And um, I think somewhere in my notes. I was supposed to say nice things about these tools that I forgot to say. Um, look, I think, I, I think data analytics, big data, all that, it's here to stay. Um, and I think there is real promise, you know, because these tools do allow for the, the problem, you know, one of the frequently identified problems in the criminal justice system is the enormous amount of individual discretion that permeates, right? Individual police officers get to make decisions um, in the early stages of the criminal process with very little oversight by courts or really by anybody else. Later in the process, individual discretion also dominates in terms of district attorneys and judges and everything. And, and that individual discretion has a lot of, has some good qualities, but it has a lot of bad qualities that we've identified over time, right? I mean, it, it, again, it comes back to conscious and unconscious biases. Um, and removing or at least maybe feeding in something else into the decision making, um, or maybe even taking some of the decisions out of the hands of these individuals, um, isn't really necessarily a bad thing. And these algorithms, you know, you know, big data tools can, in some cases, with proper oversight, do a better job than the individuals, I think. I believe that. Um, my concern is that we have the right safeguards in place to really maximize the benefits that, that, that are possible. Um, and also that we be, on, be honest with the public about the possible shortcomings as well. You know, I mean, I think we need people to just have a better understanding of um, the, the fact that, that these tools are not perfect, um, even if we may like to believe that algorithmic decision making is. Yeah, Andy. Of the three inputs that you discussed, old data, algorithms, and new data, it seems to me that the most troublesome is old data because with algorithms, you could have people with 
different views in the room mm -hmm. in terms of what factors go into the algorithm. New data, you can know, put the cameras in places where they haven't traditionally been. The old data is infected in a way with those biases mm -hmm. that you identified, and there's no way to fix that with respect to old data. So, what do you do about that? Do you, I mean, presumably you have to use that old data in order to provide some baseline for learning. Yeah, I. I, I the, the no, you're absolutely right, and um, and this is, I mean, just frankly, an area I need to look into more. Um, because in my experience, kind of any problem that I identify um, in data analytics um, is an old problem for actual um, data scientists. And so my suspicion is, is there are answers to those questions. Um, but I, and I think there may be ways in which data can at least be, if not cleaned entirely, can be normalized perhaps in ways that get rid of some of these problems. Um, but of course, that only happens if we acknowledge the problem and have somebody in the room who points out that, that it's a problem. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that if I look into it more, I'm going to find some solutions. Um, but kind of my focus is to note, hopefully, that those solutions exist, but they're only going to be used if, um, if people recognize the problem at the, at the front end. So. And I do want to note, just to a new ComTech tradition where we will have school administration sitting separately on the bench um, for all future talks. That way, that way it's a clear divider of what's here. And it has, it's, from my perspective, it's a very stark image. Uh, so, so. If, if you take this to me, you're being judged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for this to happen everywhere. Just have a separate bench. Don't know why I've stated it. That's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. as these algorithm systems use you know, social media platforms as sort of a basis for processing big data, do you think that there's going to be a chilling effect on people's speech? Is that will have problematic effect, or should we just adapt to you know, the fact that the world is changing and just monitor what we say before we say it? Yeah. Um, so kind of going back to the Oakland example that I just mentioned earlier, um, yeah, you know, again, in what I was reading is, you know, there were citations to um, to studies that have shown, yes, there's chilling effect, right? I mean, as soon as you tell people that they're uh, they're being monitored by, monitored by the police, they're less likely to express ideas that um, that they think might be unpopular. So, without question, there's a chilling effect. Um, I mean, as to what that means and how we should address that. Um, uh, even more so than, than, than for most of the rest of my talk, I'm just totally um, taught out of my depth. Um, but, I, you know, I, I don't know if society will adjust or if people will um, start, you know, looking for platforms that are um, perhaps allow for more anonymity or what exactly will happen. Um, but, but no, I do think it's a problem without, without a doubt. So, yeah, thanks. I know you touched on that how there's the algorithm that predicted someone's behavior with the green, yellow, and the red. Yes. Interacting with police. The theory behind that was that it was it's used to protect the police officers and then to better have a cooperation between the yellows and the greens. But does that not affect how the police officers act against the reds? Yeah, without a doubt, right? I mean, uh, it, it is, you know, it, it, it is interesting, right? I, that the, the, way that these tools, so these tools when they come to light are frequently going to be, are subjected to like criticism, just like, you know, like what you were saying, right? I mean, the concern is now that the police are going to be approaching the reds with guns drawn, thus increasing the likelihood of violence, you know? Um, but it's interesting to me how these tools are really resistant to that criticism, you know? Um, and my problem is, to me, that is a, it, the, the, that criticism is that that tool is just kind of, if not a bad idea, it's being used poorly, right? I mean, sure, if it were true that we could predict, you know, who is most likely to be violent when approached by the police, then that would be great information to get in the hands of the police. Um, but if that's going to lead the police to engage in conduct that just leads to more violence, then that's just poor use of that good tool. And um, but I don't think what, any, what, what people are talking about is 
perhaps as much as they should is that um, is is the way that that tool may not be making good predictions and not for reasons that are obvious failings of data science, right? It's not just the data scientist having run their algorithm or, you know, run the, the process of creating the algorithm incorrectly. It's because of this stuff, right? They're using bad old data and they're, you know, they're, they're not listening to voices outside of police and all those kinds of things. Um, which I don't know if that, I mean, so I guess in response to your question, yeah, I think that's, I think that, that may be a bad tool and I think it um, may be a tool badly used, um, but I think there's even more going on than just that. Yeah. To come up with those scores, the green, the yellow, mm -hmm. the red, if that person doesn't have a criminal record, are they just taking into account like age and gender and race to get the score? I, I haven't looked into it closely enough to say with certainty that say race isn't included. Um, but my suspicion is is that race probably isn't inclu included. Um, I think police are sensitive enough to um, to to both the equal protection clause and case law and political uproars that occur when race is um, blatantly used, not to want to use tools that, that use race blatantly. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that um, there, it's, it's actually difficult to scrub race or religion or whatever entirely from these, um, these algorithms because um, there are, there's obviously data that may act as a pretty strong proxy for race that may still be included and, and that sort of thing. So it would be my guess without knowing for sure that no, it doesn't use, it doesn't, there's not a field in the, um, in the data set that is for race, um, but it may use pieces of information that, um, act as good proxies for race anyway. I mean, again, you're on, you're on the bench. Okay? <laughs> um, I, I agree with you, data analytics is, no, is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. We're here, we need it, so we might as well figure out. But I'm, I am also curious about, and I walk in late, so I apologize mm -hmm. if you address this, but at least I'm, I'm a Neanderthal here. I'm waiting for the, I'm try, keep trying to find the rotary dial on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. just, it's not there. All there should I'm be an app for that. There should be an app for that. So all I read about is the impact of artificial intelligence, which, as I understand it, we are rapidly approaching the cusp where it would be useful to us, whatever that means. I'm not sure I fully appreciate that. I'm not sure I fully appreciate this, but there's a whole other thing, I guess, that we're going to have to accommodate. What is the what are the implications for the next generation of smart technology, smart computers? And as I understand it, some of the artificial intelligence is just super good in, in, in some sense, but ultimately decision making gets to do with mm -hmm. the artificial intelligence role. Right. Is that a positive to try to control for some of the things that you're talking about, or is that a negative? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess, right, the example, you know, are we talking about like, I don't know, I always, I never saw RoboCop, so I can't use RoboCop as an example, but I did see the Terminator movies. Uh, well, that's another, that's a discussion for another time, perhaps. Um, but I always think of the Terminator movies where, you know, you see the, you see action from the perspective of, of of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you, um, you know, and, and a certain person will appear, and it'll bring up all this data about the person, and highlight them in red or whatever, and you know, I mean, that's what I imagine. And um, I, 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 I don't know um, if we're really, you know, how close we are to getting to that world, because um, to me, that requires people to be comfortable with um, completely supplanting human beings in, in, in the decision making in the criminal justice system. Um, if we are willing to allow that to happen, then um, I think that makes these concerns even more important. Um, because 
at least now, these are just tools for human beings to use. And those human beings still can exercise their discretion for good or ill if they think something is, is weird is going on or incorrect or they think something different ought to occur. Um, but yeah, I mean, once you have, you know, uh, artificial intelligence running policing, um, I think you, you know, you really need to make sure that, um, that you've, you better have used good data and you better have better algorithms and you better kind of have a better grasp on where these robots are going to be deployed and all that kind of stuff. So but. there are people doing some of that kind of work in the judicial area. Mm -hmm. Those analytics with regard to the Supreme Court outcome. Mm -hmm. I did research 20, a long time ago dealing with intermediate appellate courts with as of right jurisdiction and the decision making came out, you know, in, a, in, in approximately unanimous, unanimous affirmances 98.5% of the time. That's within, I mean, when you talk about one and a half percent difference, mm -hmm. that's within whatever that error is that we mean error mm -hmm. to expect. And that was way before we thought about these things, but I thought about what are the implications for that. So we're talking about what are, what are judicial decisions in these databases of information, right? You could apply predictive analytics, which people have started doing with Supreme Court decision making. And that decision making, the, the people are not comparing as well as the computers are as well as the predictive analytics in, in cases. So we may not be as far away from those kinds of assessments. And I'm not sure that the outcomes would be, uh, would be all that different if people are in a group thing situation determining outcomes at a rate that is within the margin of error for what you would expect. And, you know, the idea that we would transition from predictive analytics with algorithmic um, basis to some kind of artificial intelligence at some point does not seem terribly far-fetched. Yeah, I mean, I think that to me the big difference is between um, predicting decisions and making decisions. Um, and, you know, in my in my Fourth Amendment paper, I argue that um, human beings still need to be making the decision of whether um, it is proper to engage in a search or seizure. And quite frankly, I think the same logic applies to judicial decision making and to a lot of different steps in the um, in the criminal justice process, um, which is essentially that making those decisions requires a consideration of the totality of the circumstances. And at least as I currently understand the technology, um, computers um, and artificial intelligence continues to be limited um, in the information it can consider by the information that it's provided. And at least until those systems are capable, um, not just of acquiring information, but also deciding that it's going to acquire a new kind of information for some reason, um, then they can't, they can't engage in a holistic determination of, of, of anything. Um, now, I don't know, maybe that'll happen. I, I, know, I know people are working on it, don't get me wrong. I'm fully aware of that. Um, and I think what, if they can solve that problem, then perhaps we, yeah, we, we are in a different place. You know, so. Microsoft, Microsoft's recent experiments with the Tay AI situation, I think, fairly indicates how far we are from the singularity. Um, although uh, there, you know, people like you know, no less than Stephen Hawking have expressed concerns that we are getting to the point where, you know, Mike alluded at the beginning, getting to the point where we have decision-making processes that can't be understood by humans. And of course, when you, which is actually, we're almost out of time, but something to think about, of course, is the efforts to ban uh, military robots, mm -hmm. right? Where you have it, Hawking has warned about uh, the creation of weapons that can't be understood. Um, you start getting to a world where and that's, which is kind of a tough one to end on uh, because we're just about out of time. But one thing that Mike and we can talk about separately, although hopefully, you know, look forward to the writing in this space, where do you draw the line between uh, legitimate, of course, legitimate, quote unquote, law enforcement, right, which includes the need for discretion, right, and the overlay of privacy. Which is, which is not the same as secrecy, mm -hmm. which is related. Of course, I think it'd be not this paper, mm -hmm. but the next one. Um, we are just pretty much out of time, so I want to thank Mike for joining us today. It was fascinating. Thank you, guys. And I, and I, did, you know, and I, I should have said this up front. Mike, Mike's work, I mean, I, Mike is certainly a colleague and a friend. The work that uh, Mike
Elon is doing, and really the scholars across Elon University addressing cutting edge technological issues that are not only not well understood, but that are not getting the attention they deserve is quite remarkable. Elon has, uh, through uh, a number of circumstances, built really amazing depth in the technology regulation space broadly across the communications department, political science, business, law, right, and even other departments too. So particularly since I'm talking to mostly students in the room and mostly law students, um, I encourage you to reach out to the law and tech scholars that have been here this year because they are very interested, as Elon is, in engaging with you. Um, and that's kind of the message that I want to leave here, that we're, we are blessed and fortunate to have scholars like Mike and, 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 and soon-to-be Dean Armino, who spoke earlier. Dean Hiley has written on taxation and technology, and uh, Professor Fink, others, Professor Friedland. So take advantage of the wealth that's here. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a great rest of the day.